Welcome back to Unlocked. Ugh. Uncle Octopus? Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> Uncle Octopus is the new name of the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome back to Unlocked, guys. As you can tell, there's going to be no shortage of laughs today because I have on Stormy Warren. Hey, pal. Welcome. Good hey, this is a change you. of pace for you. I, I, it's weird being on this side of it. So if I accidentally flip it around and start asking you questions, just throw something at me. <laughs> oh, I will. I okay. will. Y'all, Stormy has been on air for 40 years. And this year. You'll know him from Sirius XM, The Highway, my favorite channel to listen to. I keep it on in my car all the time. <laughs> Smart, yes. So, 40 years. We just yeah. talked about this before coming on. You were started on air at 13? Yeah, I started working for a, a radio station in Tulsa called 14K92K. It was AM and FM simulcast. And uh, there was a program director by the name of Mel Myers who, for whatever reason, took me under his wing after a school field trip and just said, you really want to do this, don't you? I said, more than anything in the world. And he goes, well, come back tomorrow. And I came back the next day and the next day and the next day and never left. No yeah. way. And I did anything. I worked for free records, concert tickets, because I was too young for them to actually pay, pay me. Pay you. Yeah. And so it took about a year and a half before they actually could start paying me. And That's awesome. Yeah. So what? when did you come to Nashville? Came to Nashville in 1993, November of 93. Okay. Thanks to the guy on your shirt. The, the right. Charlie Daniels. Uh, without him, I would not be in Nashville. What? Yeah. Okay. Tell that story. He was my very first interview when I was working in the TV side of things for CNN. And okay. It was a show called Showbiz Today in Los Angeles. Yes. And I was obsessed with Charlie Daniels. And I got an opportunity to do a story for the first time as a field producer for the show, Showbiz Today. And the producer goes, mm, okay, I, you're, I, you haven't really done this a lot, so why don't you just pick somebody? I'll give you a cameraman and an editor. If put together a two-and-a-half-minute story, it's good enough, we'll air it. Yeah. And then you get to do another one. If not, you're back to the drawing board. Oof. So I figured I only had one shot at it. So why not just pick your all-time childhood idol? And so I did. And oh, I reached my. out to Charlie Daniels' office in Mount Juliet, Tennessee, from L.A. And they said, well, Charlie's actually going to be in uh, Southern California in a couple of weeks. Will that work? I said, that would be wonderful. And did the interview. I sucked as an interviewer. <laughs> why? I mean, this is me. I had a pad of paper. You're Charlie. I mean, so, Charlie, you play a pretty mean fiddle, right? <laughs> that was me. I mean, it was the world's worst interview of all time. No. But he answered it like, you know, Walter Cronkite or Dan Rather or Anderson Cooper or whoever yeah. your favorite news guy is asking the questions. Wow. So it didn't matter what was coming out of my mouth. He gave me everything I needed for the story, which yeah. is amazing. He, and that's just the kind of guy he was. And from that point forward, we developed a friendship, and he came out to L.A. for a few more years, and we did more interviews with him, and I got him on more programs and got Charlie Daniels' name back out there the way it deserved to be um, after, you know, Devil Went Down to Georgia and Simple Man and, mm -hmm. and all the success that he's had. It was He was still putting out really great records, so it was fun to celebrate what he was currently doing. And he took notice of that, and he finally said, one day, son, you're going to move to Nashville. I said, Nashville? I thought of it as like Oz, yeah. Wizard of Oz. I'd never been there. Seen it on TV on the Nashville Network. You're too young to even remember the Nashville Network. Yeah, I have no idea what that is. <laughs> yeah, it was based here in Nashville, and it was a country music-themed and country lifestyle cable network. Wow. It, it was everywhere, and it had a huge slice of the pie for television viewing, and it was a big deal. And I watched it every day, and uh, Charlie goes, you need to come work for TNN. I said, Okay. And uh, he wrote me a letter of recommendation and uh, said, my wife will help you find a house to live in. And why don't you uh, come on out? Two weeks later, I loaded up my truck and moved to Nashville. That's amazing. Yeah, it was really special. I would not be able to do anything without Charlie, without the program director at 13 years old, without Charlie Daniels and, and, a, and a few other big believers in my life over the years. But For sure. But Charlie, I always say all my life, there's always been Charlie Daniels because I bought his first album at nine years old. And then I did my first interview with him at 19 years old. Holy cow. And then he was there when I launched my own TV show, uh, Country Music Across America at the time in mm -hmm. 2003. Okay. And he was at the big press conference to announce it. And then I spoke at his Lifetime Achievement Award celebration for leadership music wow. as a surprise guest. And that I thought that was going to be the crown jewel of my relationship with Charlie. Yeah. And it was. Um, but then the full circle moment came in 2020 after he passed and his manager, David Corlew, called me up and said, would you mind officiating his service? Oh, gosh. So from nine years old to officiating his funeral service. 
it was that gives me goosebumps. It, it was it was an amazing. So when I see a Charlie Daniels shirt, I hear his name, I hear his music. He's he's always a part. That's literally such a God thing. Yeah. Like that, I just chose to wear this today it's, and had no idea. That's amazing. I thought it was like, oh, she's done her research. No, <laughs> had absolutely. You know, what? I'll take credit for it. I yeah. did my research. Had no idea. Yeah, he was he was my hero. He was my friend. My kids called him Uncle Charlie, and and his wife Hazel is amazing. Charlie Junior. His son, the Paula, BB, David, uh, Angela, the entire organization I've known for 30 years. That is amazing. Yeah. That's such an awesome story. And then how did you end up at Sirius XM, the highway? Well, because of the radio background, and I worked at Pirate Radio in Los Angeles. If you want to Google Pirate Radio, it was the most magnificent radio station ever wow. born. It was the most creative launch they did everything right, except Nirvana came in and changed the whole format of music, and they disappeared after two years. But other than that, yeah. it was a perfect radio station. And I always loved radio, but when I moved out to Nashville, uh, TV was where I was headed. Yeah. And so I did TV for a while until finally John Anthony, who was the program director at Sirius XM, reached out to me, and he goes, Stormy, you've done radio before, right? I said, yes, it's my first love. And he goes, well, prepare to love it again, because we want you to come to the highway. And this is when it was split with Sirius and XM. Okay. Before the merger. So I was working for XM, uh, the highway at that time. Wow. And I do. I love the highway. Like, mm. absolutely love it. And too, so I will I. say, <laughs> uh, yeah, of course, I will say it had a special place in my heart when MC was on the highway. Yeah, Mary Carlisle, our, our mutual yes. buddy, a, a, a little sister to me, a, a big sister to you. Literally. So, y'all, MC, a lot of people who follow me have seen photos of me and MC. MC was I met MC before I ever moved to Nashville. Oh, wow. So I was dating like a wannabe musician. And then why? I know. Why? <laughs> why? I should have learned my lesson. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so the first was, time. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, okay, Stormy. <laughs> Remember whose podcast you're on. Remember. And I met, so I met her when I was 16. Mm -hmm. So almost 10 years I've known MC. Yeah. And just like, the greatest human being ever. And I remember when she got the job at the highway. As my co-host. Yes, yeah. as your co-host. And she, I had never seen a human being more grateful and more excited. And she just like, that was her goal. That was her dream. And it was so like, it was such an honor to watch. And, and it was such an honor for me to see how much passion and dedication and effort and work and, yeah. and drive she put into her job. I mean, she came in with zero radio experience and said, I don't care. I'll learn it. I'll figure it out. And yeah. she did beyond uh, the most creative, fun, energetic, and typical a one of a kind, unique <laughs> MC way. <laughs> yes. Like yeah. all the segments you guys would do and the funny things in the mornings or something about a straw at one point. Yeah. Like, does a straw have one hole or two holes? Yes. Does it have one hole or two holes? That was one of my favorite And what's things. your answer? I mean, I would say one. That, that, it makes sense, right? It makes sense, but technically two. two. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know either. <laughs> but it's stuff like that that like made her so unique. Yeah. So it, it's funny though, because I don't remember when the first time was that I met you. Um, I do. Um, and it was uh, we, I, it was at the ACM Awards, and I was presenting. Okay. Yes. And, and your dad and me and, and dad were presenting and, as well. And, and he was complaining that you weren't wearing enough clothes. Yes. 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 He goes, do you know how much that dress cost? He goes, there's no fabric to this dress. It's, it's completely, why even wear a dress at this point? <laughs> yes, that's very, okay. <laughs> now it all registers. Yes, that is. But that was the first time you and I met. Okay. Yeah, I was half clothed, <laughs> You guys. were half clothed. Um, <laughs> this is great. <laughs> that is, okay, so ACMs. And then, too, people don't realize how small of a town Nashville is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we like, all know the same people. We all know the same people. We've all run into each other. And then I recently did... Sirius XM, the highway you morning came on show. Our show came on the morning show. And I will say what I tell people about you is like how much respect I have for you after that morning, because the, it was a great morning. It really was. We had fun. Mm -hmm. I feel like your ratings were probably definitely up that Off morning. Off the charts. Off I, the I charts. Mean, <laughs> you could hear them ticking as you were talking. <laughs> and, but you had made a comment that was, you were an asshole, for yeah. lack of a better term. Sure. And at MC's baby shower, you walked up to me and said, hey, Savannah, I just want to apologize to you. Mm -hmm. Like, what I said was uncalled for. I should not have done it. Sure. And, like, I'm sorry. And the amount of respect I had for you in yeah. that moment, I mean, you have no idea. I literally tell everyone. I'm like, Stormy is a class act. 
I appreciate that, and I, and I will apologize to you again here on your podcast. <laughs> I, I don't like doing that, and it, it, it you know we get caught up in the moment yeah. sometimes, and just and you get words, caught up in and the words headlines. come out. Yeah, and, and words come out uh, without a thought of the implication, without a thought of what the what actually was going through your head yeah. about the whole situation. Yeah, and I, I took advantage of it, and I and I apologize. And that. Literally, you have no idea because going through what we're going through and as a child and hearing stuff about your parents and hearing. And I just remember that morning, like when it was said, I just remember like my whole body getting hot, you know, and I saw it and I was like, I I don't know how to respond to this, you know, and Mm -hmm. I like weaseled my way through it. But you did a great job. I mean, (laughs) like you were you were in a really difficult situation that I put you in and and you handled it amazingly. But it was wrong. No, I have. So much respect for you. Literally anyone that I speak to. And I'm right like, back at you, by the way. I, I just, I've been in situations where people have said hurtful stuff and it's just, they go on about it. They continue to mm-hmm. do it. They whatever. And I'm like, I've never encountered someone who like came up to him and was like, you know what? I'm really sorry. I should not have said that. And I feel like that's what more what we need more of in yeah. today's day. Accountability. And age. It's it, accountability. Exactly. And, and if you can't hold yourself accountable, how do you expect to hold anybody else accountable? Exactly. And that's how growth happens. And that's how it's we all yeah. make mistakes. And it doesn't mean your relationship with someone has to be over. If yeah. you can uh, take accountability for it and say, I'm sorry, then let's move on. It, it, it could actually build a relationship. It can't. Um, that's what I will say with you. Mm-hmm. That moment in time, I was like, okay. Like I want to get to know Stormy better. Yeah. I love Storm. Like, just that a simple apology like that, I was like, that tells me all I need to know about him. Well, thank you for saying that. But yeah. um, again, I, I will continue to apologize no, for that you, Hey, one apology is enough. Right, That's what my done. dad's always taught Truce? me. He's Truce? like, hey. Truth. Truth. Okay. One apology is enough. <laughs> one, but that, I was like... That was awesome. But even that morning, though, I had so much fun with you. It was great. And you're such a fun person (laughs) on air and just in person, too. You're no different. I mean, it's what you see here is what is is her 24 seven. I mean, it's it's wonderful. It's like you are a ball of energy, a ball of just spirit. Well, you have to. You know, I'm like, life is already depressing enough as it is. Yeah. So, like, start acting how you want to feel is really how I feel. Manifest it. Yeah. Yeah. And too, I mean, I would make a great co-host because I know the majority <laughs> of the guys you have on your show, so it's great. <laughs> we won't go there. <laughs> no, it was really funny because that morning too. I don't want to get in trouble again. <laughs> no, you're not gonna. You're never gonna get in trouble again. We can be honest. That morning too, you called me out about the Matt Stell stuff. I did, and I was like. Damn yeah. it, Stormy. Why did you have to do that? And too, it was like, thank God though. I was like, yeah, he's a cool guy, but not for me. Yeah. Like well, that's great. Yeah. So it was that was really funny that morning. You, you you have an unabashed honesty about you that makes it easy to ask those questions. Yeah, because my thing is, it's like if I've done something, I will take full accountability for. Yeah. I'll talk about my life because I would rather tell my story before someone else does. Sure. And for me, for what I do, that is so inviting it it makes it really for a fun dialogue to know that you're going to get an unfiltered honest response whatever the question and maybe that's why I pushed it too far that (laughs) that time is because I felt I could yeah exactly and it's stuff like that where I'm like and too Nashville's a small town so everyone knows everything really already you know it may not be national news but I always try to tell people is that if you try to keep something secret in this town you're wasting so much energy Oh, so much energy. So much energy. Nothing it's, is a secret. 12 people have already told 12 more people by the time you've <laughs> thought about trying to cover up your tracks. Exactly. Because so. I was talking to someone and I get a call from MC one day all the way in Florida. And MC's like, Savannah, what is this? And I was yeah. like, calm down. How did you find out about right. that? Yeah. It's a small town. <laughs> it really is. Yeah. it's uh, You learn that very early when you're in town. Oh, yes. I most certainly did. So <laughs> what would you say? You're obviously day to day. You do red carpet stuff. You mm-hmm. do what? Looking back on all the interviews you've done, what is the biggest regret you have in an interview? Uh, that's funny. I like that. I like that question. Um, regret in an interview. It's a it's a repeating offense uh, with one particular gentleman. He knows this, so I can say this. But uh, Garth Brooks. Yeah. He's a genius when it comes to preparation for an interview okay for be the receiving end of an interview where he knows exactly how much information he's he wants to give out mm-hmm. how he wants to deliver it and finds a way no matter what your questions are to control the narrative to wherever he needs to go and it's brilliant there's nothing bad about that that's called no, that's it's, being it's a called great... owning your brand yep. and and doing which uh, being good at your job 
but I find it a challenge every single time to try to find the, the little crack, you know, to find something and, you know, a question I could ask. And trust me, I've pissed him off, too. So you're not alone. <laughs> um, I've had to apologize to him, too, a few times. But but again, it's the challenge of it that it, uh, that I love. Yeah. And I'll go back and listen to or watch an interview with him every single time and see something so obvious that he dropped as a little bone, you know, like pick that up. Yeah. Pick that up. Pick that up and run with that. That's I want you to pick that up. I'm not going to give it to you. You've but got you've you got to. And I miss it. And I just bulldoze right over it. I'm just like, how did you miss this? How the hell? That would have been a headline if I would have picked right. it up. And, and many of them would have been. Mm-hmm. Many and he, now it's the point where after an interview he just smiles and he goes, missed again. Missed I'm like, again. God dang it! Oh. Man, so it's I, I, I throw things at t- monitors at the television studio when I'm watching them back, yeah. going, "How did I miss this?" Hey, honestly, that would be like a great segment for you. Yeah, is to replay back interviews and funny you should say that. Replay them back and then say funny. like shit, this is what he was talking about. Absolutely. And it happens more often than you think because what he did without him knowing, or maybe he did it on purpose, I don't know, but he trained me. Yeah. And so for every interview since the very first one, he read my questions upside down one time on a notepad. I had a notepad on my lap and we're sitting just like we are. And he was looking across, just kept staring down at my notepad. I'm like, you're reading my questions, aren't you? He goes, yes, sir. I'm like, Wow. And so from that point forward, he taught me never to have notes. And I've never had notes for an interview. <laughs> well, from yeah, that because point. you have notes, you're not getting you're not truly, connected. You're, not, you're connecting. not connecting. No, because they're too worried about what's on your notes. Absolutely. You're going, okay, what's next? What do I have to ask? What do I have to I'd rather miss bullet points and to to not sacrifice the um the conversation. Yeah, one hundred percent. And would you say it's hard to balance your job and humanity? It's the same when it comes well, to interviewing people. I think the only uh, the only option I have is to approach what I do on air the same way I would approach you and I sitting at a bar. Yeah. And, and I don't take a different approach. There's people who in our world who take on characters mm-hmm. who become someone they're di- they're, they're not yep. when they're on air mm-hmm. and they go or on stage yep. or, or whatever they do. They and It's an easy thing for them. To <laughs> Aaron <do. laughs> over here laughing. <laughs> Pointing at you. Because <laughs> she knows, she knows who I'm talking about with my. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, so I mean, people tend to do that and maybe that's their own way of, separating yeah. their personal life and, and real life from the, the, the mayhem that is the entertainment business yeah. and broadcasting. It's so much easier for me just to keep it the same person. Well, that's why you've been successful for 40 years is being authentic to who you are because people can tell that, like I can tell when I'm being interviewed by someone, someone who's just looking to get the next sound bite. And then someone who's looking to, actually learn or want to get to a deeper level with you. Yeah. And that's, uh, and to be honest, one of the driving forces beyond that, behind that for me is I'm asking questions. I want to know about myself. Mm. And so I actually treat every interview as a learning opportunity of how I can be a better person. Yeah. Either by someone's mistakes or someone's successes or just perspectives. And each person I talk to, I try to take something and put it in my pocket that I can take and and use as a building block for myself. Yeah. And uh, either professionally or personally or whatever. So it has to be an honest line of questioning. Yeah. Because if it's not, I feel like it just goes straight downhill. Yeah. And I'm curious. I, I, I love people. I love, want to know how people tick. I mean, I've got a million questions for you, but that's not this pl- platform. Hey, if you could ask me any question right now, Stormy, what would you ask me? What is a, what does six year old Savannah look like? Oh, and who is she? Geez. What's her personality? Dang, Stormy. That's honest. I, I thought about this this morning before we was going in there. Yeah. And I actually was picturing this question and I was just like, what is the one thing I would, I didn't, I don't know and would like to know about you. And I, I want to know what six year old Savannah was like. I don't ever remember being a kid. Yeah. I don't like, because of the hurt and trauma I endured, it was instant grow up. Wow. So I always remember, like I knew so much more than any other kids my age knew. I knew things I shouldn't know. I was, I, and I just remember there was always this conflicting feeling of like, I don't feel like anyone else. And I feel like that's why, like, you know, I moved out at 17. I, you're an old soul. Yeah. And I think because I've endured so much hurt. And so like, I don't ever remember 
really being a kid. I think that's where the question comes from because I don't hear you talk a lot about yeah. your, your childhood. I don't yeah. hear you talk about that time. And I'm going to teach you a little tip that I got from a therapist, a friend of mine. Yes. And this is so brilliant. When you deal with trauma, you're dealing with it at whatever level. I don't know the level of trauma you had, but trauma is trauma. It doesn't trauma matter. Trauma trauma, yeah. yeah. But say it's pretty extensive trauma. Most people in their life experience trauma this much. Mm -hmm. When people experience real trauma, like real trauma. Whether it's abuse right, or whatever. They experience this much. Mm -hmm. So that means these people can't be asked to understand what this feels like. Yeah. So we tend to hold people accountable, accountable for, for something which I, they don't no, know. They, they don't know. They, and they so, don't have the capacity to know. Right. And so you shouldn't judge them for that. That's not their fault. But you can't expect them to know what this feels like. Yeah. And you can't blame them for only feeling this much, you mm. know. It's and so that is, I will say, from someone who has experienced a deep level of trauma, you're just like, you do. You hold people accountable because you're like, how the hell do you not realize, like, this is how I feel or this is what I'm going through? Without say, and, you, and if you say that, it, you look like an asshole. Yeah. And then what you all really have to do is just show compassion and mm -hmm. empathy and just say, you know, you're right. You, I mean, whatever they say about yeah. if they are trying to identify with your trauma, they're trying. Yeah, and they're so trying. They're trying. And so you just kind of got to nod and go, yeah. Yeah. Sure. And too, that's also the hard part, too, is, you know, <clears throat> I started TV at 15, too. That's so, nuts. So <laughs> even though you didn't have much of a childhood that you remember, the rest of your childhood was on full display for all of yes. the universe. And so then I had to, I was working through, of course, because then I got into an age where I could start to try to understand the level of trauma that I had endured. And then it's on TV for the world to see. And so now I'm trying to play a character that I think the world needs to see while trying to figure out who I am. That's too much work. It's exhausting. It's exhausting. And and so, it but, I, but you don't do that anymore. No, it wasn't until it was three years ago, maybe. I had finally, you know, I had gotten engaged, called off my engagement, full on, like, just crisis. Meltdown. Meltdown. Yeah. And was like, I've got to figure out what the hell is going on. I have to work through all this stuff I never worked through because I took my trauma as fuel to, like... I, to work, 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 work. To, to, to so hide you don't it, have to, to focus. I call it chasing ghosts. Wow. So you're yeah. chasing a ghost. You, people either chase ghosts that they're never going to reach or they're running away from a ghost they're never going to get away from. Mm. And I think that's what drives. But it also drives very successful people. Yes. Because they work harder at it because they're running faster than most people are because mm -hmm. they want to catch whatever that thing is or they've got to get away from whatever that thing is. Yes. And I went to, I remember I went to onsite and I've been Good like very public about it because it was a game changer for I'm me. I'm very pro therapy. Very pro therapy. And it took a long time though, because I grew up in an atmosphere to where it was like, you know, being from the South, you keep all your dirty laundry yeah. inside. You don't put it out for the world to, you know, no. And so everything was kept super inside. So for so long, I was like, nah, a therapist can't help me, whatever. And then when I let it all out, Blah. yeah, I was like, you felt a thousand pounds lighter. Yeah. I'm like, this works. Yeah. It's a, it's a real thing. Did you do EDMR therapy? Uh, I've done that. I've done neurofeedback. Oh, nice. Neurofeedback has been, that was EDMR would be fascinating for you to really mm -hmm. dive back into only because that, that'll open up that little locked part of your childhood. Yeah. Yeah, and the neurofeedback that if you, have good. you tried it? I don't know. I, I don't, don't even know what that is. So it's there's a place here. It's called like Tennessee Neurofeedback. It's in Brentwood, and they put a cap on your head, and it like scans like your brain waves, and it shows actual like physical trauma, where the trauma emotional is, emotional trauma, um, ADD, ADHD, all these things, oh, wow. and it shows it in your brain. And like for instance, mine, like my scan came back, and it was like. My, your brain is supposed to be like one side anxiety, mm -hmm. one side depression, basically. Mine was just like constant back and forth. So I was never in one state for too long. Yeah. So that's why like my brain is always so exhausted because it's just jumping back and forth between anxiety, depression, anxiety, depression. And then you do these sessions and it's 30 minute sessions and they put these different sensors on different parts of your head and you just like watch you, uh, Netflix, but like the screens going in and out, you're hearing things. Yeah. And my fuse 
like got so much longer. longer yeah. Like so much longer. My patience, my like my sleep got so much better. It was insane. I was like, at first Good I was like, you. this is like a hoax, like something, something about this, but it worked. No, I don't love it. And even if bottom line is if you're willing to embrace the process, you're yes. going to get something out of it mm-hmm. regardless. You have to, but yeah. that's where it starts. It yeah. is embracing it and wanting the help. You have to do the work. Yeah. No one else can want it for you. No, no. no Cause I tried that in relationships, do therapy, do therapy. I can't be doing therapy and you not. No, that's it's, It Mm -mm. never works. You have to have both sides on board. Yeah. And so for you, obviously, TV, radio, all entertainment Mm -hmm. as a whole. When when was the point? Because I know it came. I just know from personal experience. When was the point that you were like, I can't do this anymore. I've got to like, I've got to get into therapy. I've got to get. You know, because I yeah. feel like you play a role for so long. My, mine, I, mine really isn't a role. I think it's it's who I am, and it's been a part of me for so long. My therapy doesn't have to do with my job, I guess, directly. But my therapy had to do with uh, Route 91, the shooting in Vegas. Okay. And that was, you know, 20, October 1st, 2017. And, and you were there. I was there. Yeah. And I didn't realize how much that truly affected me until I realized it truly affected me. And that's, yeah. but you're talking about that aha moment where you just go, I can't do this on my own. Yeah. Like I, I, I cannot handle this trauma by myself. Yeah. And it was, it wasn't even an option. Cause I was like, what, like you, I grew up in Oklahoma, stubborn Okies. We don't need help. Yeah. No. And I sat on a couch for like six weeks. I'd go do the radio show. You know what? I take that back. That's the one time where I played a role. It was after that shooting where I had to go back on the air and pretend like everything was okay. Yeah. It was not okay for a long time, for weeks. And so that was one time where I actually, and I, and I think that's why I had to go to therapy because I felt really mm-hmm. guilty. I felt like I was faking the audience. I felt like I was faking everybody and not taking care of myself. Yeah. So, but yeah, it was the most valuable thing I ever did. And it's it's great to be able to talk about it. It's great to be able to work through it. It's well, great that's to when you know side. you've done the work is when you can talk about your trauma. Absolutely. And be okay. And, like and, it's, to, it, and to own the narrative. Yes. It, 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 to know that maybe today I don't want to share all of it. Yeah. So we have different levels of what we share. Yeah. So you have the you have the the summary. You have the fluff, then you have the extended you got- version, and then you got the full money yeah. for whoever's in for it. Yeah. You know, because I know there were you know the whole industry after that shooting. I mean, it affected you know, everybody. Jason and Brittany were there tons, and like I just know from knowing them personally, you know, yeah, just. That whole thing, I just remember it was like so heartbreaking. Yeah, it was it was absolutely brutal. Then five years later, we had to relive it again with this uh, documentary called 11 Minutes, which mm-hmm. came out on Paramount and brought everything back up. And I didn't realize the impact that was going to have. Now, it, was that therapeutic to you looking back or yes, no? Yes. Uh, the process of doing the interview for the documentary was extremely therapeutic. What was not, which I did not anticipate, was a two-week press tour promoting the documentary uh, where it was the same questions. kind of like it should have just spoke for itself. It, it, it should have. Yeah. And, and I mean, I'm glad I did. And I'm glad people tuned in because it's an important piece of history yeah. and it's an important perspective, multiple perspectives of what happened that night. And it's really a story of resiliency and, and love and compassion. And, um, well, cause how people, how this town came together. Yeah. And, and how people help people. And that's what, that was the story. And that's why I wanted people to watch it. It's still available. Um, but it, it was really important to get people to watch it. So I knew the I knew the value of doing that press tour. I just didn't anticipate the effect it would have on me. Yeah, because it yeah. has an effect not only on you personally, but your family. Your, oh yeah. Like I've met your wife. Like she's yeah. an angel. She's amazing, and she was on the phone during the shooting, oh. and so she heard the bullets, and she heard the screams, and she heard the chaos, uh, everything, the sirens, the sc- screams. Uh, she heard it all, but she had no visual to match with it. And so that's even... It's, it's almost, that's it's more, almost more traumatic. Yeah. It's almost, so she actually uh, endured almost, uh, I mean, as much or even more trauma than I did. Wow. I will say that's, too, one of the PTSD, like the neurofeedback I was talking about. Like, it's one of the things that touches on as well, which mm-hmm. is awesome. Yeah. But wow. See, PTSD and that's the is thing <laughs> is people don't realize when they just hear you on the radio... Cause you're, you've got a voice for radio. Like you, <laughs> you do. Is that a, is that a, uh, diss? 
No, no, that's fine. What? <laughs> what? There's an old there's an old joke that says you've got a face for radio. Oh. <laughs> I'm done. You've got a face. Hey. That's, I appreciate that's that. That's hilarious. But like hearing you, you hear like how upbeat you are and how like it's just enjoyable to listen to. Thank you. And no one though would ever know. And there was the lie. Yeah. And there was the lie. And that that was a really traumatic thing to have to I remember talking to my therapist about it. It's like, I feel like I'm a fake. I feel like I'm, I would love to be able to get on and just talk about how I really feel, but nobody wants to hear that driving to work. Yeah. Well, you know, see, day in and day out. Kind of the comparison, just like on TV, like I, all throughout the years, even like everything my parents have been going through, <laughs> we were never allowed to speak about it. Right. So we felt like the liars. We felt like the fakes because we're like, we just want to talk about it. Yeah. But executives would not allow us to speak about it. Sure. And so then we look like the liars and that we yep. didn't talk about it. And it's a it, catch 22. It eats, it literally will eat you alive yep. because you, I have gotten to the point where I'm like, I don't even know if I know who I am. Right. Cause you're working so hard. Yeah. Yeah. It's, and that was the first time that's ever happened in my life. And, and I'm sure for you too, yeah. you know, it felt like, like, except for maybe when you first started and you were trying to figure out who you are, Yeah. but it, it's, it's not a pleasant feeling. No. It's not a pleasant feeling, which makes me wonder about certain entertainers and certain people that do put on the, the mask. Mm. It's like, do they feel like they're faking or is that, or have they just accepted that is just an extension of themselves. Well, see, it's crazy because I've talked to so many artists and the majority of them don't know who they are. No. Outside of an arena or a recording studio. There are exceptions, but there's few. There's few. And yeah. a lot of them, like, it's, well, who are you? Oh, I'm a musician. No. Like, yeah. who are you? And a lot of them, it's that's what's so sad is because it's like, I've had a few on my podcast and sometimes it'll take 10 minutes. Sometimes it'll take 20 for you to finally be like, Hey, Hey, there you are. There you are. Uh, yeah, like, yeah, finally, exactly. finally, I know who you are and not what you do. Right. Which is, it's gotta be exhausting. That's, and that's why I do what I do. Yeah. It's, that's my goal. I've, it's like a minor. You got a chisel and you're just like, tink, 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 <laughs> yeah. tink. Gold. Then, you know? yeah, when yeah. you get there, you're like, yes, yeah, I and got it, it. And there's an endorphin rush that comes with it. Yeah. You're sitting in your seat. You know, it's really fun to have that moment where you just go, ah, here we go. Yeah. Now, now it's like, it's like fishing it's when you finally, finally get a bite. It opens up. Yeah. That's awesome. So you coming up, what do you have? You've, you're going to be at Stagecoach. Be at Stagecoach again. We'll be broadcasting on the highway uh, the entire weekend. That's going to so, be awesome. So I'm trying way. to potentially take my podcast to Stagecoach. I know some people. Hey, come on. I know some people. Come on. It could be so fun. It'd be, it'd be a blast. I mean, regardless, I'm going to be there, but I would also love to do my podcast from there. So it could be fun. Well, there's, um, you go backstage at Stagecoach, it is absolutely filled with influencers, podcast hosts. Yeah. You know, there's uh, bloggers, vloggers. Uh, it's, All the things. Then there's room for everybody. Yeah. So uh, it would be, I'd love to have you, you know, hang awesome. out. That would be hey, great. Hey, y'all, Stormy and I, we've teased for years. Um, I've always told him that I would be his co-host any day. We have. I've said it. You, you've, you've mentioned that a few times I've today. I've mentioned right? it. I've mentioned it. Come on, Stormy, <laughs> pick it up. What's it with Garth, you know? Like, yeah. come on. Come pick up the ball. Pick I'm up got, the ball. I'm, I'm dropping you a bone. <laughs> <laughs> It's hysterical. <laughs> I'm dead. So, okay. So you got stagecoach. Yep. Um, going to Australia again. Um, we do, I host a festival in Australia every year. That's it's been a awesome. couple of years since I've been there because of COVID. Um, yeah. and probably the last time I was there was 2019. Wow. So it's going to be good to get back and, and see our friends down there. And that's going to be it's awesome. A huge, huge. Morgan Wallen's going down this year and a bunch of, I mean, just that's going to be huge. And then we have uh, all the country thunder festivals all across the country yep. and Canada this okay. year. And those, they line up for those festivals. I mean, we have them in Arizona. We have them in Twin Lakes, Wisconsin. We've got them in Kissimmee, Florida. We got them in Calgary and Craven up in Canada. And it, it, they're just everywhere. And they're so much fun. That's, and isn't that crazy that like, this is what you get to do for your job? Uh, the neat thing about the travel part and the festival part for me, it, it, uh, this is kind of a hack for what I do. Um, it allows me the opportunity to actually see our audience up close and personal. So Ooh. I get to, I get to know our audience instead of being here talking into a microphone and wondering who's watching. Yeah. We get to see who's 
listening and watching and get direct feedback. And so it really helps me do a better job to see who our audience is. Yeah. And so that's, well, for sure. Cause when you can put a face, like yeah. that's what you remember. Absolutely. So when I'm on the air, I'm picturing every face that I saw all summer long at a festival and remembering names of the people that I met and stories that they told and artists that they're in love with and, and what drives them to be country music fans. And yeah. without that, I don't, who am I? It goes back to the honesty thing. I can't be honest with, as a connector of fans and musicians and, and the country music lifestyle if I don't know who I'm talking about. Yeah. Now, who would you say, I'm going to put you on the spot. So the best interview of all time, like one of your favorite artists to have there been an, has there been an artist that you've been like, you're an asshole or yep. Okay. Um, I, 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 will I tell won't this make one. you say the name. I won't make you say the name. Okay. Well, I'll, I'll say the name because I, <laughs> you know, we got to hold people accountable, but it's not, um, it's not really an artist so per se, but it's a celebrity, you know. Okay. And, and I've talked about it. In fact, I, I threatened to not air his interview at all because it was, he was so much of an ass. What? Um, Wayne Brady. You know, the guy who was, let's make a deal and was on whose line is it anyway? And he's a improv actor and okay. comedian and whatever. And I idolized him. He was like, I was Isn't so looking that the forward. Worst? Yeah, I was so looking forward to having him on the show. And I asked him a few questions and he answered him so condescendingly and like, what are you, what are you talking about? Like, why are you even asking me that? The, the one question that echo echoes in my head, I asked him, I said, so Wayne, um, I mean, you're one of the most accomplished singers, uh, improv artists, actors, comedians, and, and you did this all by overcoming a speech impediment. And he goes, a what? Um, a speech impediment? He goes, Where'd you get that? I said, just about everywhere you read from your history, it's That's... in there. And he goes, I had a stutter. What? He said, I had a stutter. <gasps> no way. I do know him. Yeah, exactly. And I said, wait a minute, isn't that a speech impediment? And he goes, whatever. <gasps> and then it went downhill from there. Oh, and no. So it was, and it's really, I mean, maybe he had a really bad day. That's why I want to say, you know, disclaimer, Wayne, let's do it again. Let's have fun. Because I, I would hate that to be the impression that I have. Yeah. Here. Well, and see, and that's the biggest thing is I love being able to, no one's going to know that they need to make change unless they're called out on their actions. Right. And I have attempted to do that with people and mm -hmm. you'll get a response from someone that's like, you know, for instance, like just people talking crap about me and my family. I'm like, Hey, let's have a conversation face to face. You might learn something. Let's get the facts straight. Yeah. Like, and whatever the facts are, I will take full accountability for sure. them. If they are in fact facts, yep. I was like, but, Instead of talking about me, let's have a conversation face sure. to face. And never once, you know, taken up on the offer and it's just going to continue to talk crap. And I'm like, that's where, you know, it's like the quality of people. It's like, yeah. I want someone to call me out if I do something wrong. And I want to be able to apologize, take accountability and say, you know what? Now I can be better. Yeah. But you don't 100%. have a lot of that. Instead, you have people that sit there and goes, well, that's cute, but that's not my truth. Yeah. Well, wait a minute. But that is the truth. That is the truth. Yeah, there is like, not a your yeah, truth and my that's, truth. That's not that. No, that's not. And they're telling you that that's not the, your truth is yes. not your truth. Yeah. Yeah. And that's the crazy part. So that, okay. Wow. That's, that was yeah. the tough. I couldn't imagine being in your seat for that interview. It was horrible. And, and then I went and made the decision. I said, no, I'm running it straight up as it was. Cause it's, he needs to hear that. And has, have you heard Nothing. from him since? No, no. But wow. may, maybe down the line, like I said, I'm chalking it up to a bad day, so yeah. I, I, I forgive him. But at the same time, you asked the question, what was the hard, you know, the toughest interview or, or interviewing an asshole? Yeah. Uh, that day he was an asshole. Yeah. So I don't wow. say he is an asshole. That day he was an asshole. Yeah. Well, hey, and too, it's like you caught yourself one earlier, yeah. you know, so it's like you can, Absolutely. we all have crappy days. I don't, I don't, I don't mind knowing when I'm an asshole. Yeah. You, you, you made me realize <laughs> I was an asshole. So, you know, it's, it's fine. I don't mind that at all. It, it also, but what you were saying earlier, when other people are telling you or talking behind your back, or yeah. with the, it, there's a great quote. I think we talked about this when you were on our show. Okay. And it's something I teach everybody who comes onto our show, the, you know, the young kids these days. I can't yeah. believe I'm calling kids. I was the kid. I was the kid. I was the no, kid. I'm not the kid anymore. Um, but, you know, Nick and Macy, who work for me, they're yeah. like 27, 28 years old. Yeah. And they're, they're at a spot where they're being 
thrown into what you've been into since you were 15 yeah. years old. And that is the spotlight and everybody judging, everybody making their opinions, everybody talking behind your back. And the best survival tool I give them and I gave myself was that it is absolutely none, none of, of your, your business, business what other else thinks, thinks, of thinks of you. you. Yeah. It's none of your business what someone else thinks of you. Yep. And it's, I live by that. Yeah. Well, it's so true because you will literally, I mean, you'll bury yourself if you're so consumed about what other people say. And you only read the negative comment. You you could have 7 million positives and that one negative will just go, oh. Yeah. And it'll eat you alive. Yeah. So so you can't let it. And too, my thing is, it's like when I hear it, I use it as an opportunity to have a tough conversation. And actually, mm-hmm. because when you get down to it and you start to converse with these people, it's like they don't even know why they said what they said. No. Or they don't even know if their information is accurate or not. It's because they uh, they lost their job the day before or yeah. they, they, they they got in a fight with their, their spouse mm-hmm. and they just need to vent. Yeah. And, and you just became a bullseye. Yes. And so and it's just keyboard assault, random keyboard assault. It really is. So 40 years you've been mm-hmm. doing this. How much longer do you think you got left in you? Did an interview. Do you know the name Ralph Emery? If you don't, that's okay. Okay, no. Um, he's a, a legend in country music broadcasting, and he did it for a very long time. On, started on radio, did television for TNN, the Nashville Network, okay. and, and on and on and on. And he was one of my heroes uh, growing up. And we did an interview with him. The two of us were there. Actually, Evan Farmer from CMT was with us, too. So it was the young gun, me, and the, the old legend. Not old, but just legend. Yeah. And it was just our perspectives on country music or whatever. And somebody was asked that question. He, the interview goes, how long do you want to do this? I said, well, I'm not in this for the short flash. I'm in this for the Ralph Emery Hall. Oh. Meaning I, I'm, I'm, I don't plan on going anywhere. I, I hope I don't. Um, if I'm still doing this when I'm close to 80, like my dear friend Charlie Monk did until he passed away. He, yeah. was, he, was, he was on the air was on, a legend. on Sirius XM until the week before he passed away. Wow. And so, I mean, that's what I want to do. I would It's like Willie Nelson. I, I, I don't know for a fact, but I could only dream that his desire is to die on stage yeah. or die going to another show. Uh, being stagnant probably isn't one of the ways he wants to go. And, yeah. and Charlie Daniels, I think, honestly, in my opinion, and his wife and his child and everybody who worked with him would would agree that probably what killed him more than anything was the heartbreak of not going town to town and playing shows. Mm. And that it was stressing that he couldn't pay his staff. He couldn't pay his band. He couldn't, by not moving during COVID, yeah. it, there was a lot of stress that came well, with Well, that's it. the thing. It's like with these musicians and stuff, it's not just them. It's for you, a staff of 40 people. Literally. Yeah. Like, you're running it. It's not Charlie Daniels. It's Charlie Daniels. Enterprises, yeah. uh, Jason L. Dean, LLC, Brad Paisley Incorporated. And, and it's just, mm-hmm. they, they're on the name, but it takes an army and they are responsible for providing for that army. Yeah, that is so true. It's a lot of stress. It is. I I mean, I know the world that I have in my life. I couldn't imagine having that many people and families and kids that are really relying on me to do the best Absolutely. that I can do. And now they do their part to make you your best. Yes. But at the same time, it is there's a lot of responsibility that comes with it. But yeah, but if I'm still doing this in my 70s, I'd be the happiest man in the world. I would still listen to you in your 70s. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. I today. would. I would. <laughs> It'd well, be a lot of fun. All right. Last question I've got for you. Yeah. What ha- what has been the biggest feud? Oh, by the way, this is a guitar string that Charlie Daniels played <laughs> Amazing Grace on at our friend Troy Gentry's funeral with Montgomery Gentry. No. After he died in the helicopter, we did his funeral, and Angela, who worked with Charlie Daniels, grabbed the guitar string off Charlie's guitar after he played Amazing Grace and made a bracelet out of it. <gasps> that so, is amazing. It's pretty cool. Holy cow. Yeah, I sorry. love stuff like that. I was like just that. looking at it like, oh my gosh. Yeah. That's amazing. And it's still such a God thing that like, it's, that. I wish I would have done my research to that caliber. I want that shirt. Hey, I mean, <laughs> I don't think, think it would fit? fit, but <laughs> I'll give it to you. <laughs> All right. What's your question? Your biggest feud that you've been in with an oh. artist yeah. since being on air. Um. I don't think this would be a secret. Um, Clay Walker. Really? Clay Walker. It's an interesting... We we started our relationship very odd, in an odd way. It went back and forth for many years to the point where I think we finally just went, why are, why are we like this? 
why can't we just, and more, and he was actually the one who kept coming after me going, could we, I don't know what I did, but can we fix it? And I'm like, yeah, this is dumb. And so we're, we're dear friends now, but it went on for years. What was it? It was just a. I don't know. It was just a, we, I didn't connect with him. Okay. And, and that's really hard for me to face. Like if I, I don't, it's like something's not right. Yeah. If we're here. not connecting, it's, it's just like, like just, it pisses you it, off. It pisses me off. And I think I took it out on him. Yeah. That we weren't gelling. And, and so Clay, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, <laughs> pal. Jeez. <laughs> forgive me. Here we go again. What is this? The stormy apology tour? I know. God. Seriously. I know. I've got, look, I've pulled Wayne, it out of you. Wayne, I'll apologize if I pissed you off too. Wayne Brady. I mean, it's like <laughs> Savannah, I'll apologize again. Jeez. <laughs> Three apologies. Who else? Anybody else? My gosh, it's confessional. <laughs> to anybody out there who have hurt in any way possible, I am truly sorry. And do I actually believe that when you say that? I do. I do believe that. And it's a, you, you get to a point where it's like, why do we hold this shit? Well, and that's the best part is whenever you get to the, the end of an argument with someone and you're like, wait, why? why, why what are I we even, doing? Why was I even pissed off to begin it's, with? It's stupid. And I don't have, I'm a Pisces. I don't stay See, mad I don't long. all that. See, I don't stay mad long. Okay. Basically, it's just my personality. I'm a seven on the Enneagram. I'm a Pisces. I mean, I'm like... Uh, 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 I am all positivity. I am all thing. I don't like negativity. I don't yeah. like conflict. I don't like any of that stuff. Yeah. It's just, I have no place for it. And if I'm in a bad mood, it pisses me off. Not because of the bad mood, but just because I'm eating and losing time that I could be positive. Yes, that is so true. And I feed off positivity. And so bad moods piss me off. So like, what does it mean? I know I'm a Leo, but like, what does that mean? You're aggressive. <laughs> Oh, and she's an eight. Oh, yeah. Okay. Do we? Are we compatible? Probably. Probably. Yeah, we're probably very compatible. See. I know. Makes sense. Yeah. Oh, and two MC. MC. Because our birthdays are that month. That's so true. Oh my God. See, and that makes total sense. And that's why the, the compatibility is there. See, yeah. it's there. We've cracked the code. Look at that. We have cracked the code. I dig it. Well, thank you for coming wait, on my wait, podcast. I'm not oh. Yet. Yes, I for y'all. This is this is big, okay? Okay. So you're not the only one with a podcast. <laughs> um, I've got one called Exit 209 with Stormy Warren. So I love and that. And it's everywhere you can find your favorite podcast. You got to hold it up better. Yep, I'm sorry. There we go. And there we go. Or over to this camera, either or this camera. I don't care. Yes. So um, it's Apple Podcast or Apple Stitcher, Podcast, Spotify, Amazon, in, anywhere you can find anywhere you can find your podcast, in a Sirius XM app, wherever. Uh, we're on our third season. It just started with Kelsey Ballerini, um, and we've got Cole Swindell, we've got Lainey Wilson, we've got Tim McGraw, we've got uh, in the past episodes we've had uh, Blake Shelton, Keith Urban, Florida Georgia Line, Carrie Underwood, Ashley McBride, Miranda wow. Lambert. Um, and what's the premise of it? It's Exit 209 is the, uh, this is yours, by the way. Yay. I love me a good hoodie. Yeah, I know. It's I a cozy hoodie. A hoodie. They're very soft on the inside. So don't wash it. Okay. Um, it, it's, it, it takes an artist's life from birth, their, their very first memories, to their first big break when they knew they were going to be doing this for a living. And they mm. finally, whether it was their fourth number one, whether it was uh, an award or whether it was a platinum album or whether it was even just their first number one, whatever in their mind was their first big break. And some of them are really cool because some of them feel that they haven't had it yet. Yeah. And it's, uh, and they admit it. They're like, I'm still looking for the first big break. Even though they've had a ton of success, they still don't feel like they've made it. Like mm. Gary Allen feels that way. And some other artists that I talked to. That's just, crazy. Yeah, but that Kip also, Moore. that comes from the drive. trauma at some point. The drive we're talking about yes. chasing the ghost. Yes. Because you feel like enough is never enough. Yeah. And so that's why these, this podcast, this series is so fun. Is it on video too, or yep. just audio? It's video and audio. It's, right, I'm going, is it on YouTube? Uh, not yet. Not yet? Not okay, yet. well, I'm going to watch it wherever I can watch it's it because I'm be like very invested in this. And the neat thing is the story never changes because the birth to your first big break, that's a piece of history that you can't change. Yeah. So it's not like I'm asking about your brand new project or your brand new album, which will get dated. This is like, this is a part of their life that will never change. So their, their story can live on forever. There's wow. going to be coffee table books. There's going to be all kinds of things. Exactly. You know? That is awesome. So Exit 209, yep. Stormy Warren. Thank you. I'm honestly really excited for this because everyone knows I love music. Music has always been therapy for me. Yep. And it's. You will love this. I'm so excited. And I genuinely am. I would not say I was if I wasn't. So. And I feel completely unlocked. 
<laughs> See, I got you unlocked today. You, you got me unlocked. Three confessional apologies Yeah, I know, exactly. Today. Man, I feel, I feel released. I feel... <laughs> Since you guys have started being more vulnerable, have you realized that it doesn't drag people down as much as you thought it would? 100%. Mm, yeah. yeah. I think for me, I've had to work on starting this podcast. The biggest hurdle I've had to overcome is not... You know, our show really was a scripted comedy. For yeah, the most part, 100%. like it was not reality. It was very much a comedy. So it was, I remember like we could be fighting. We could be, our whole world could be falling apart. Then we walk out the doors, you put a smile on your face and you laugh and you, cause we were always told no one wants to leave feeling worse about their life than when they came. Correct. So I've had to try to become more vulnerable mm -hmm. and talk about my hardships. And I have learned that throughout that process, it's created a deeper connection with mm -hmm. my followers, listeners. Well, because they believe you. Yeah. They believe you. What you thought you were putting out there was believability, but you were presenting 50% of yourself. Mm. And if they see that there's another side, a truthful side, an all honest, vulnerable side, it truly, it doesn't mean you have to live there. Yeah. But if you show it and you show that you could go there and show that there is an honest foundation of some pain and yeah. some uh, obstacles and struggles along the way. It, it becomes, it now I, I know some other people who do this for a living that take it the other direction and that's all they share is yeah. their trauma, their darkness, their, mm -hmm. the, the, this, their struggles. And, uh, and that's one way too, but sometimes you need to show the light too. Yeah. And you got to show the light too. So if there's a balance, I think it just, it, we're people. We have these, all these emotions. There's yeah. no one who doesn't have the spectrum of emotions. For sure. So was there a point in time after the shooting that you came on air and were like, hey, this is how I'm really feeling? Yeah, I had to admit it eventually that it's like, man, I'm sorry. This this is hard. Yeah. I mean, this is, I'm trying to do my best. I want to play, you know, goofy games and, and I want to uh, laugh and, I, and, and I'm going to do my best to do so because that's what you, you all need to get to work. Yeah. So you're, I mean... Afternoon drive, totally different deal. I, overnight's totally different deal. But yeah. the, the the demo for a, a morning drive show is people wanting us as their second cup of coffee. Like you can do it. Yeah, it's yeah. like you go. And so I, I had to apologize and be honest a few times and just say, I'm sorry, I'm not going to stay this way forever. But I, I'm, there's there's still a lot of healing that needs to get done. And if you'll just take the ride with me, we're going to get there. And did you see your audience become more connected? Mm -hmm. 100%. Hundred um, percent. So, I mean, what you were most afraid of? Mm -hmm. I, I, in fact, we wanted to stay off the air for a week after the shooting because I thought I'm not going to be worth anything to yeah. anybody. And when we finally came back on the air for a full show, we did one little thing a couple of days after the shooting, and for a full show, the amount of response that came back of like, we don't care, we, you're just here. It's just like we, mm. we needed to hear your voice. We needed to know you're okay. Even if you're not okay, you're okay. You're here. You're here. And you're a part. And so it's like we're now connected again. And that was a revelation of such importance that I, I, it's I mean, okay it's, a, it's a blessing. And it, it was a blessing to feel that embrace. Yeah. And it was just like, oh crap, I can, I can be real. This yeah. is, it took a lot of weight off. Wow. That's awesome. Yeah. Well, I have so much love and respect for you. Right back at you. I mean, I man, you are a trooper, man. <laughs> hey, you know, you got to make the most of it. I love you. Thank you.